Our panel of break fix petrol heads are back for another rousing what should I buy debate. Using unique shopping criteria, they are challenged to find our first time collector the best vehicle that will make their friends go, where do you get that? Or what the hell is wrong with you? At the next Cars and Coffee. What's going on, everyone, and welcome to another installment of Break Fix. I'm your host, Brad, a.k.a. The Triple Six. With me, as always, is our co-host, Eric. Hello. But on tonight's episode, we have a topic that is very near and dear to me. We're talking about what it's like to be a big man in a small man's world, or as we like to say, big guy in a little car. And help me out tonight, we have a few special guests that are going to tell us about their experiences being big and or tall in a world designed for people of smaller stature. So without any further delay, let's go around the horn and have everyone introduce themselves. Your bio, your height, weight, or whatever, if you're comfortable. If not, you can just muffle through. And what you're driving now, why you're driving it or whatever. So we'll go ahead and start. Andrew, Andrew Mason, why don't you go ahead and, and kick us off? All right. Hey, everybody. Um, my name is Andrew. Stayed about 6'4". Weighed in this Monday at the doctors at the triple three. I've been a big guy my whole life. And uh, <laughs> now I drive uh, bigger cars. I, I've always kind of looked at the, the Miatas and the S2000s and thought, man, that'd be that'd be nice to drive something nimble and quick like that. But it, it doesn't happen. I drive a 16 Chevy SS and a uh, factory five roadster well one's big and one isn't quite big enough so yeah and we're gonna have to talk about the factory five roadster and how you squeeze yourself into it later on in the episode all right a bendy um... guy no (laughs) no (laughs) all right so let's let's go ahead and have gordon since he chimed in all right gordon bell six four three hundred ish i'm a 38 inch inseam and I'm I'm a 48 inch ish hip, and the rest is torso. Been as low as 220 ish when I got out of school, up and down, back and sideways. Don't fit in a lot of things. For a <laughs> volumetrically exceeding individual, I'm not that large. I only have 11 and a half feet, and my hands are only seven and a half. So I'm not a a massively non normative individual. My head's a a, a large. My cool shirt is an XL, which for a 300-pound guy is not a lot. So, yeah, I'm, I'm not that guy. And Gordon, to your point, my ring size is a 17. Holy fudge. Dude, that's like my knee. <laughs> yeah, these are all normal size. Presently drive a 2012 CTSV Cadillac, which went from daily driver to kind of track inquisitive to, yeah, we're going to do this, to now it's, oh, hell yes, we're on it. And the car is a total gut and yeah, just having a lot of fun. Tried smaller things. Most don't fit. I always thought it'd be so awesome to have that car and that car and the other car. And then I tried them on. It's like, yeah, that's not going to work. So I drink heavily and I'm okay with it. Hey, Gordon, is it true that you incorporated the walker into the roll cage as part of structural (laughs) integrity? Absolutely. And what you do is when you exit the vehicle, you merely kick the side panel and it folds out and you drop your old fat butt into it and away you go is that like the umbrella that comes out of the rolls royce doors oh, you got the walker I, I didn't know you knew about the umbrella <laughs> i've incorporated the umbrella yeah nice all right so let's go over to jason uh he's new to gtm and one of eric's uh long co-workers what's up jason what's going on thanks for having me on yeah so i stand six foot eight and about 285 pounds right now so large tall- human <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, I, I like to think of myself as supersized because I'm a 36 inch inseam and I'm like a 50 extra long, right, jacket size. So currently I drive a 2016 uh, LR4. The, literally the reason why I bought that car is to fit in it for headroom. Like I did I, all types of weird athletic stuff. So I would, did Scottish Highland Games for a while. And so I was 6'8 and I was like pushing 330 at the time. And I was driving an Acura TL and my wife was behind me and she called me and she's like, this is ridiculous. Like you look like <laughs> an elephant on a tuna can. Like we got to get you, we got to get you into something. Monkey else. hump of a football. <laughs> yeah. So she's like, we got to get you something else. So that's how I wound up in the LR4. It's, it's, <laughs> it's not the most efficient vehicle in the world. Fastest thing in the world, but um, it fits. Right. So that's what I'm driving right now. Yeah, nice. Before Crutch goes, I think we have Brian Young on the line who just joined us as well. <laughs> yeah, I'm here. All right. Um, well, I'm Brian Young. I'm 6'4", and I'm just shy of 300 pounds. And right now, 
I drive a Jeep Grand Cherokee and a 2005 Jetta TDI. I alternate between them. The Grand Cherokee just because it's comfortable, and then the TDI just because it's fuel efficient. <laughs> yeah. Man, a few words. <laughs> yeah. There's less oxygen at that height, I hear. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there is. And there's been alcohol introduced, so. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, uh, okay, okay. Well, as we get the swing of it, let's uh, let's go back to Mike. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So lastly, we got uh, Michael Crutchfield. He's been on the show a few times. Why don't you tell us about yourself? Well, I'm 6'2". That, that's all I'll say about that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a gentleman of larger stature, but I also only have about a 31-inch inseam, so I'm very tall in the torso, too, which in, in itself presents its own problem. My current track toy is actually a Beetle Turbo S, a 2003 Beetle Turbo S. Cause it, mostly because it has more headroom head than, uh, than a GTI. <clears throat> we'll, we'll get into some of the interesting stories I've had on track being an instructor in uh, small cars. <laughs> One organizer in particular who, gave, <laughs> who was very amused after he saw me climb out of my student's car the first time. <laughs> <laughs> and lastly, I'm Brad, the, your host. I stand at 6'4". I'm about 325 as of this morning. My track car is a GTI. Um, I've instructed a Miata and I've driven a Lotus Elise. You know, those are fun. My head sticks up clear above the windscreen there. Um, But yeah, that's it. That's me. So, Andrew, how do you squeeze yourself into that Roadster? Why do you have the Roadster? I have the Roadster. My dad and I built it. Got the kit back in 2011. Got it fully road legal and painted by 16. Dad's about 5'10". You know, not svelte or anything, but it was a difference. Um, but he, he always wanted to build it. We, he was talking about this from the time Factory 5 started in the mid-90s. Like in high school, I was test driving Fox Body Mustangs because he was looking at it like a donor car. I fit in it by basically bolting the seat to the floor. Like I still have the, the seats that came with a nice thick bolster. Those are gone. I got some um, Kirky buckets with like, you know, half inch of, of vinyl on them. And uh, that's bolted directly to the floor pan. And doing that, to kind of comment on, like, follow up on what Mike said about inseam versus torso. I'm 6'4". I, have a, I wear pants in, like, a 32 inseam. I can sit in that Cobra because I can get my relatively shorter legs under the dash. Brad can't fit it for shit. I mean, he can't do it at all. So I've got a 34-inch inseam. So exactly. You know, I'm, I'm right at the cusp of the, the big and tall store. When we first built that thing, we had some nice, like, adjustable seat brackets for moving it back and forth. We thought we'd use those. We had the th- seats that came with it. And I was literally, like Brad said about that Lotus, like, the top of the windshield was about at my nose. So like I was getting bugs in the face driving it. First we replaced the seats and that was better. And finally we just bolted the seat to the floor and dad could drive it that way. And that's just kind of how we left it. So uh, dad passed in February and I inherited it along with his pickup and now his Hyundai. So I got like six cars in the driveway. It's getting a little mad. I've taken an autocrossing once. That was really fun. Definitely want to get some stickier tires on it and try that. I definitely want to see what might be able to be done. Maybe a taller roll bar in the back, something to help me pass that broomstick test so that maybe it could get on track. Mm. Uh, we'll see. I did think of something while you're talking because you're talking about cars we've had, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I started out, my first car was the 1989 Thunderbird SC. So that was, uh, a, that was a fun car. SC um, stands for Super Coupe, people. That's a supercharged, supercharged V6. Whole lot of torque and, and a five speed. Chicken. Super chicken. <laughs> Super anyway, chicken. It, it works, man. <laughs> but um, for a while there, what, two or three years, Brad and I both had fourth gen F bodies, both had Camaros. And the other guy we used to hang around with, he had a fourth gen Camaro too. And he was six, seven. And so Damn. we either, we either rolled three deep to get somewhere or it was three big guys. And one of us had to be riding in the back and the little, like <laughs> where, where the bench seat in the back wasn't a bench. It's just two little cushion buckets on either side of the transmission of the uh, drive shaft tunnel. And so, I always ended up being in the back seat somehow. The only well, I was, way I, fit I was in that back I seat a few times. Come on, I was practically spread eagle. You put you, you put one foot in the uh, behind the driver, and then you sit kind of over behind the passenger. Yeah, it was yeah, it was yeah, rough. Basically, basically. But yeah. uh, what about you, Jason? So you've got the LR4. What uh, what other vehicles have you had in the past? And I'm assuming at your height, you've always got trouble finding something to drive. Yeah, so it's a it's a crazy story, right? So my dad, for 40 years, he owned an auto repair shop. So we were constantly like passing cars in and out, like stuff would come in, we'd buy it, fix it up, turn it, sell it. So I've driven some really cool stuff. Like I had a uh, Toyota Land Cruiser, like the FJ type. I had an old one of those when I was in high school. Two of the weirder ones that I've had in my time. For about three weeks, I was driving a Maserati by Turbo, like one of the old like 80s ones. And my dad <laughs> caught me driving about 90 past him on the highway. So it ended that. 
the car that I had probably the longest that like fits in with the group more. So I had a, uh, it wasn't a cabriolet. I can't call it a cabriolet. I can't stomach it in my heart, but it was a, it was the rabbit convertible before it was a cabriolet. And a guy had totaled a GTI, like an 88 GTI. So we completely franken car that thing. And we put like, you know, new speed springs and built steam shocks. And like, we completely like reconfigured that car and people looked at it and they're just like, it's, come on, man, that's, that's a cabriolet. And then that thing would run like a freaking mouse on cocaine. I mean, it would just go. And <laughs> it was awesome. It was fun. That ended up getting taken away from me when I went to college because my dad was pretty firmly convinced that I would kill myself. So that got swapped for like a Volvo 240 wagon that was like turd brown. The ladies- The, the Jalopnik special. Yeah, dude, the ladies love that thing. <laughs> not Not really, so- so yeah, that's what I've kind of driven. I've been dying to kind of get in with Eric and, and get out on the track and do some stuff. But as I've gotten older, I've gotten broader. I haven't gotten smaller. And so like, I literally have to go try on cars now. Yeah, so, so that brings up an interesting point, you know, having to shop and try on cars. I know, Gordon, you've probably looked at a lot of cars before you settled on the CTSV. I want you to tell us a little bit about how you found that that car was the one that you were able to fit in. Yeah, so back in the day, went into practice in 1990, started making a few bucks, and the first cool car I had was an Oldsmobile Toronado Trofeo, 1995, with the North Star engine, I mean, a 12-foot hood, you know, cab four design, a little tiny interior, but the car was spacious. Traded that in and bought a an Audi, Eric, Audi TT, baby. What? Oh, hold, hold on, hold on, hold on. You had a TT. At the time, so I graduated dental school at 212 pounds, okay, mm-hmm. as opposed to the 300 that I presently am. So two, 220-ish. The cool thing about the early TTs was on the console, there was a little triangular brace that was bolted to the sides. I took the driver's side off and I could lean my leg into the console a little bit. Those cars are volumetrically efficient. Really good cars. <laughs> I had plenty of room, plenty of room. The fun part was watching people watch me get out of the car. I get out and people would be like, how did that big son of a bitch get out of that little tiny car? (laughs) And you'd see them sort of doing the mental math, like how the hell did that happen? And that was the very first car I ever took to the track. 1995 Summit Point, Maine, you know, and I'm like, my buddy had a Porsche 930. We both drove our little red cars, as the wives say, away from the house as went on our little boys weekend. And I was hooked and I did it for four or five years and then practice got busy and fast forward. So prior to the Cadillac, I had a, a CLS 63 AMG Mercedes, which is a spectacular automobile. It's not a track car, but it's a really nice car. And so coming out, I've always leased my cars. It's one of the few things that, that the IRS still allows corporate entities to do is write off some of this stuff. So wrote off the CLS. Now I'm into something else. And the CTSV comes out. I'm like, oh, daddy wants one of those. I mean, who doesn't want a 550 horsepower GM monster? Drove it as my daily for three years and realized this is kind of a fun car. And then started thinking about getting back to tracking. So it's an 11. I got back to tracking at about uh, 14, 15, bought it off lease. So I leased it for three years and then bought it off lease which is a very bad decision from a financial standpoint, but it made sense for me because there was nothing else at the time that I really was in love with. I mean, E63 AMG Mercedes, $100,000 car, M5, $100,000 car, CTSV, $69,000 car, bought off lease, $38,000. So let's buy this pig and see what we can do. So I bought it and immediately realized it was a really bad track car. So let's just start <laughs> frank and caddying the car. And so every system in the car gets reworked. And Cadillac figured that out because then the ATSV and then the, the, the Gen 3 CTSV were great cars. But the Gen 2 CTSV was just a car that a bunch of guys in Detroit sat around smoking a doobie on a Friday night and decided to put a big engine in a small car and be like, hey, dude, it's awesome. The car <laughs> blows on the track. There's not a system in the car you don't have to rework. But I fit. So I instruct and I've I've gotten in other cars. So my problem always is bottom of dash, console, steering wheel. I don't fit in anything. Head, not so much a problem. Legs, I'm not a bendy guy. Sorry, I don't fold up. So the CTS has been my thing. 
And the first couple of years were development. Can it do better? Can it do better? Yes, it can. Okay, let's go to the next step. Let's go to the next step. So this winter full gut car is absolutely a whole new thing you guys have never seen. Turns out I was driving a seven cylinder car for a while. Because my number one <laughs> cylinder was absolutely the, the spark plug, the electrode was gone, the spark plug was finger tight. So you guys will see a whole new thing this season. So Brian, <laughs> let's just step back for one second because you owned a Mazda Speed 3. And I know that was a car that you enjoyed. How was the fitment in that for somebody of your height? So the Mazda Speed 3, surprisingly, I fit very well. If you want me to go into the details of a little bit, it was fully bolted and tuned. It had around 400 horsepower, but it it was a really fun car to drive. I, the only problems I have usually getting out of is getting out of cars because my seat is usually back behind the pillar. So I have to like swing my legs out and then kind of like stand up out of the car. And my wife used to hate when I'd have a pocket knife on my right pocket because that's where I carry it because I would chew the steering wheel up because I'd swing my hips and my hip would hit the steering wheel every single time without fail. And to this day, it still does it in just about everything I drive. So when I drive her WRX, I I don't put the pocket knife in my pocket. And uh, I feel really bad for that rental car that I just had, that charger that I just had out in Colorado a couple weeks ago because I tore the steering wheel up pretty bad. (laughs) Yeah, it's always the swing out. I mean, Stepping down out of the Jeep is fine, but stepping up and out of a car for me is what, you know, my hip usually hits the steering wheel just about every time. I feel you. So I got a question for both Mike and Gordon. Since I know, I know Mike just did this, you know, or he did it a couple years ago with the BMW and Gordon, you just did this. Finding safety gear like the Hans and the Simpson Hybrid <laughs> and seats and stuff like that. How hard is that for, for bigger guys like us? I don't sit in my seat so much as on my seat. <laughs> How many yeah. seats did you try out before you were able to find one you, you found you, that fit? So I started with a sports seat that OMP had because it didn't have much bolstering, but it was also a reclinable one. So it's not ideal for, for most situations. I actually just had to go down to OG and just say, find me your widest seat. I could have gone the Kirky route. You can even get Kirky to custom make you a seat. Build the seat to your measurements if you really want. But I wanted something a little more comfortable than that. <laughs> <laughs> than just sitting on a sheet of aluminum. So I just, I went down to OG and said, bring out all your widest seats and just went one by one through the seats they had and until I found one I was happy with, which is what is now in the, uh, in the bug. The BMW that's out front still has the uh, reclinable sports seats. I did exactly the same thing. I went to OG and Matt and the guys brought out a bunch of stuff, tried things on, and most seats top out at 19 to 20 inches on the base width. I've got the race techs out of uh, New Zealand, which are 21 and a half inches base width. It's a very nice, compliant, snug fit. It's not tight. It's not loose. I didn't realize how much I was banging my knees against the door in the console trying to stabilize. The seat with harnesses transformed the way I use that car. And I'm, as you said earlier, I'm, I'm mounted on the floor. I'm three quarters of an inch off the floor with my seats. And I've got an inch and a half of headroom. Nobody else can see out of the car in the passenger seat. You know, I, I carry can. with me. Pat, well, yeah, Brad, you can see through. Can confirm. I feel like a six-year-old when I run. It is so comfortable in the passenger seat of that CTSV. I, it's like sitting in a uh, like a luxury liner. It's amazing. <laughs> so, getting a seat that fits properly is is key. I would like to have a little bit of partial enclosure, and I may try and fabricate you know a partial halo because race tech doesn't make a halo attachment for that but you know at the end of the day it's it's far better than what i had and the six point harness is just you know i feel locked in and i feel compliant and it totally transformed the way i managed the car whose harnesses are you using gordon just out of curiosity honestly i can't answer that um i think they're scroth but I'm not sure. I got them from Piper Motorsports who did the cage in the car and they worked with OG to to source those, but I'm not sure. I should know that and I don't. You got the Simpson hybrid? I do. And so I I saw a post you put out, you know, when we were talking about this this webinar, I have the largest hybrid available. And it sort of fits like a a 13-year-old's bra on a 28-year-old well-endowed woman. You know, it, 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 it rides up. The only good part about the hybrid is it has those secondary clips that you can thread through the lap belts. Because without that, it would probably be up around my neck and I would asphyxiate myself. 
somebody needs to figure out that not everybody is a 5'8", 170-pound man. Is Just anybody out there listening, please you know, write this down. Not everybody is 5'8", 170 pounds. What about you, Crutch? Do you have one? Do you have a, a head and neck restraint? No, I probably should, but... Which one would you go with? Do you think His head's not that valuable, just saying. <laughs> it's what's inside that's valuable. You know, some people will probably be happy if some of the story time with Crutch Story has just left my brain. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, I would, I would have to get a hybrid because the, the bug's still running three points. And, you know, with student cars, it's unpredictable. But as a taller, larger gentleman getting in student cars... I'm often in a seating position that's suboptimal just in general because I'm reclined. Yeah, <laughs> practically laying down, but can still see over the dashboard. Yeah, I'll probably get more neck compression than, than a basal skull fracture. So, Jason, you said that you're looking to get something. You're thinking about getting into like motorsports and like track days and stuff like that. Yeah, so like I've always had like a like an interest in it, but like, like obviously talking to Eric, it like lit the flame to the gasoline, right? Like, yeah, I, that's what I'm he did to me. <laughs> so I'm, I'm super interested in it. But I mean, I think what's really helpful, like being the new guy, like not the not the guy that's into racing, but the guy that wants to get into racing, like looking at some of the information that's out there that you guys have on your website and like some of the podcasts, right? Like what to drive, like some, there's some aha moments out there that hit me that are like, well, hell, I never thought about that. Cause you, you made a comment in one of the earlier podcasts about like what to drive. And you're like, yeah, but when I have my helmet on, I have no headroom. And I'm like, mm-hmm. son of a bitch, uh, what's going to happen to me when I put it? Cause I've got a big old bucket head, right? I mean, I think the helmet I'm going to have is going to be like a modified Home Depot bucket with like a hole cut in the front. <laughs> like, so I think HOD like, allows those. <laughs> like, so like, how the hell am I going to drive with something on my noggin? Like, to me, that was an aha moment. Like, I hadn't even thought about never having gotten behind the wheel of a race car with the proper safety equipment and stuff like that. So now it completely, like, revamps what I get to think about and what I could possibly think about and, like, change the conversation for what I could drive. For you, I will say cars that do not come factory with a sunroof usually have a little bit more, yeah. you know, headroom because they didn't have to put in the, the mechanics for the sunroof there. So what are some of the cars that you're, you're thinking about or considering or would you consider? It's interesting, right? The whole perspective has changed over the last little bit, right? So I never considered driving something American, right? I always thought about like the GTI route or the Jetta route, and that's probably going to be more difficult, right? So looking at things like a Mustang, right? And that completely changed the dynamic of like what I would do. The answer is I don't have a damn clue. Like, I guess the best thing for me to do, honestly, is to go out to a track day, throw a helmet on my head, climb it, ask if I can just sit in somebody's car really quick and see what fits, what feels natural, what feels good, right? Yeah. Just to get out there. Because, I mean, bluntly, in my personal life, that's what I have to do. Like, I looked I looked at a Yukon, right? And that didn't work for me, right? Yeah. And it just didn't, the proportions didn't work out for me, especially when I put my daughter in the back seat, who's behind me, like, things just didn't fit. So, for me, that's kind of like a natural thing to, like, have the mentality that I have to try on cars like their shoes, right? This isn't too narrow. This is too short. Like this doesn't feel right. Like, I think that's what I'm going to end up having to do before I make an investment in a vehicle. Like I'm probably just going to have to come out to the track and make some friends and try their cars off (laughs) to see what I can do and take it from there. I will say that if GTI is something that interests you, everything got larger until the Mark five and then started getting smaller again. So 2006 to 2010 GTI, I think it's 2010 is when it cuts off, is uh, much more headroom than anything before or after it. Because cool. I used to have a Mark V, I have a Mark IV, but I have a bug instead. And I drove a Mark VII in uh, Australia, and it was much more snug than my Mark V was. Right on. Now, I mean, it's solid advice. Like, I'll take any advice I can get right now just to, you yeah. know, steer me down the right path. I mean, you could always do the high tower thing and, like, take the front seats out and sit in the back. <laughs> <laughs> Just take, that, a, take a helmet with you when you go to test drive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Show up at the dealership with a helmet. And just like, I'm here to test drive this car. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So back in the day, I was an auto mechanic for a while. And I worked for a, a franchise that dealt strictly in imports. So I have physically put myself in an MGA and an MGB. Now, that being said, my ass was on the top of the seat and my head was two feet above the windshield. And it was simply to move the vehicle in and out of the garage bay. But I I agree absolutely, Jason. What's going to happen is you're going to have to try on stuff. Because the defining moment for me was probably 93 to 95. Been in practice for a few years, making a few bucks, 
I'm going to go buy me the car. And driving past the one place near me, they had a, a, a rotisserie restore, restored um, Series 3 Jaguar XKE, car I've, I've fascinated about my entire life. I could not fit my skinny, long ass in that car if you held a gun to my wife's head. And they had four or five other cars there that I tried on, none of which did I fit in. I walked out of there demoralized, dejected, pissed off, and that's what you're going to deal with. I mean, there are so many cars. I, I, a guy that I ran into had a Bacani Huayra. I could not even physically get even close into the vehicle. Not that I'd ever be baller enough to own a car like that, but that being said, you don't fit, people like us don't fit these things. It's fun to think about it. It's like looking at a supermodel while you're maybe doing other things, you know? And I have to say too, sometimes it's weird things that like don't fit in cars, right? So like an Alfa Romeo Spider, like I can get into it, but the steering wheel is so freaking big in that thing that I can't actually mash the clutch because my knee gets stuck between the door exactly. handle and the steering wheel. Like I can't yep. actually get my left leg working. So it's all these like little weird nuances sometimes that come along with being, you know, a tall person. That I got money that all of you have no problem heel towing pretty much any car that's out there. Sometimes I do it by, by mistake. Yeah. I just hit both <laughs> pedals at once. Dude, I don't hit. I, I don't paddles. hit two. I hit three. I don't need no damn heel toe. <laughs> well, I was gonna say. Well, one. I don't hit. I don't heel toe. I hit all three at once because I have a thirteen four e foot. <laughs> damn. Clopper foot. <laughs> Club uh, foot. <laughs> I have like I have actually had trouble with my my throttle foot catching the brake pedal on the way up because my feet are so <laughs> in, in the eighties they called that unintended acceleration. <laughs> God, you got a foot I think like Toyota a was sued ball. for something like that. <laughs> uh, uh, to Jason's point, I mean I have a similar story. Like I was at a car show in College Park and I had the opportunity to drive. It was a 2001 Dodge Viper GTS. Oh. Uh, the guy just handed me the keys and I was like, I was, I was like drooling over this car all day. And like the guy said, handed me the keys and said, here, go have fun. I got in the car. I let the clutch out to get in for, to get it moving in first gear. And then that was it. I couldn't do anything else. I was stuck. So I had to, you know, limp it around the parking lot a little bit, got it back in the parking spot. It was like, I just, I can't drive your car because I can't, I can't shift. The steering wheel's too big. I'm, I'm in the door panel. It's just, it's, I don't know why they don't design. Why don't they design cars for us? What the hell's wrong with them? <laughs> so I was at pit race with Chin Motorsports last fall and there was a, a, a Viper club there. There was like 75 Vipers. And the guy that built a lot of these Vipers out of Ohio was there. And I expressed the desire to have a Viper because I think they're just banging cars. I've always loved mm -hmm. that car. He said, well, we can totally get you in a Viper. It's like, I don't think you can. He said, well, we've got a guy here like you. So a, a, a gentleman of our stature horizontally, but not vertically. So he said, I guarantee you can get in John's car. So we go get in John's car. And my effing knees are up above the steering wheel. They can't get under. He goes, I've never seen anybody couldn't get in a Viper. He goes, well, we can stretch one for you. It's like, you can do what? He said, yeah, we have all the bucks. We have the molds. We can stretch one. We can add, you know, a couple inches behind the driver's door. Like, all right, will you do the math on that for me, would you please? <laughs> so he calls me or he sends me an email. He goes, well, we have an ACRX donor car. It's 105000 And we can stretch it for 75000 Like, dude. Do I look like Bill Gates' son? I mean, what the <laughs> hell? I'm going to spend 180 on a toy? Nobody fits in those. If you're above six foot, you don't fit in those damn cars. Mm -hmm. Why the hell does no one get that? Yeah, and, and uh, I always had people tell me, because I, I used to lust after the Viper as well, and they say, well, Hulk Hogan had a Viper. You can fit. You're not bigger than him. Uh, yeah, I am. <laughs> yeah, he was I, a short little dude. I was in a Viper once. In the passenger seat, I was, I was smaller then, and it was a first gen, so the, the seat belt is on the wrong side. I get in the uh -huh. car, and I go, to, I go to reach over my, my right shoulder. I'm like, wait, <laughs> where's the – but I didn't have a helmet on, and getting out of that thing was comical because it's not you, – you don't climb out of a Viper. You just kind of like roll out of a Viper, and it had a hard top, so I couldn't go up. Are you sure it wasn't a Shelby Durango GTS with the same paint job? Oh God, those <laughs> things are horrible. But no, it was a, it was a Viper at the Helmets Off the Heroes or something like that. Uh, okay. 
Oh yeah, I was ta- I was thinking about thirteen triple quad E feet. Um, <laughs> like on my Roadster, it's it was. I mean, you should look at who designed it. Dave Smith, the president of Factory Five. He's like five eight. Looks like he works out every morning, but he's he's just a real compact guy. And between that and the choice that we made building it to go with a dual overhead cam modular forward instead of a small block, which is like an extra foot wide. And, and you look at like a, a normal shoe, like, you know, your, your standard issue suburban new balances, they get wider as they go down. So your footprint's bigger. I've gotten to the point where I have like size 11, like two sizes smaller, like Adidas soccer shoes. I'll wear those. I've worn, I've tried wrestling shoes. I got to the point now I just drive it barefoot. Because that's the only way I can avoid, you know, getting the clutch and the brake at the same time. You just got to figure out what works. Yeah, just like I got my brother-in-law is like 5'2 or something. He's like, I'll never play in the NBA. And you can't, you know, I I can't help that. And that's the truth for big guys like us. Like some things are just not going to work. If size was no object, like size was not a concern and money was no object, what would your car be? What, What would you, what is your dream car? Two or three of them. If you had a three car garage and you could have anything you wanted what would it be? And then to add to that, size is an, an object and it is something you got to think about. What is the, your next you know, vehicle, the next one you're lusting after for your current size? I'll go with that because I've thought through this at length. So, I mean, the, the wish list is a Koenigsegg Regera RS plus one. Second place would be, again, a Pagani Huayra or anything Pagani's made because it's, it's just so retro. As a pilot, I love the switch gear in the Paganis. It just, it harkens back to a prior age. The, the, the cars are just spectacularly detailed. What might I be in next would probably be, if I can, uh, probably a, 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 an SL Mercedes. A, a, a couple of years off SL Mercedes, 550, they've depreciated the hell out of themselves. I mean, you can buy a $150,000 at list Mercedes now, five years later for 30 grand. I think that's a spectacular value. I've always wanted a hard top convertible. I fit. I tried a patient's car on the other day and I actually fit in the car. So I'm like, daddy's getting an SL. <laughs> so as soon as my garage is built, I will have an SL. So what would I drive? I'd love to get my hands on like a Lotus Savora. I've always thought they were kind of slick looking rides, you know, well-balanced. I think something like that would be fun. I've always been a fan of English cars. So like one of the new F types, but I don't know that I want to get behind the wheel of one of the, uh, one of the V8s. I've actually heard that there's too much muscle with them. (laughs) So something like that would be really cool. Maybe an Aston Martin. I don't know. I've actually sat in one of the new kind of newer Aston Martin Vantages and I actually can fit into one. You know, they brag about them being a comfortable kind of touring car. Mm, for me, I don't know if that's the case, but I think it, I think I do fit in it. Like it's it's a drivable car, so that's kind of the route I would take if like I could have like that side of it. For what actually fits me and fits comfortably and fits my family, because my wife is six foot three and I've got two daughters that are wow. like super tall as well. Like my 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 daughter going into seventh grade is almost five foot eleven. So like the Range Rover long bodies, like the like the really long ones, those are pretty slick. I like those a lot. I actually like that, like the A8Ls as well. Those have a ton of room in them. Those are super nice cars, in my opinion. Like those, but don't like the price tag that rolls with them. So if somebody else is paying for it, I'd pick one of those two to be my my everyday ride. So Jason, if I see you guys walking through the mall, is it like watching people from Avatar, you know, strolling through the mall? <laughs> Yeah, so my so I played basketball in college at a small school in Virginia, and my wife she actually played volleyball at University of Maryland. So like I am by far not the best athlete in my house, and from the way things are trending, my daughters are probably going to be way better athletes than me. So it's cool. It's pretty wild to see like people definitely people definitely look at us when we walk into a place. Um, yeah, my my wife is six three as well, and she's a she's the best athlete in the house as well. She was a, a state champion basketball player in high school. So awesome. I, I feel you on that one. Here's the deal. If you saw the, the Ferguson family photograph, you know, the, the Christmas card or whatever, they would look normal. They're all proportionate to each other. Right? <laughs> Truth to that. It is true. If I could actually fit, I would love a Corvette. My stepdad had oh. a 78 25th anniversary, two-tone silver, white leather interior. It was a beautiful car. I was never allowed to touch it. But it was a beautiful car, and I've just I've always I've always liked Corvettes, but I, I'm never going to fit in one. Nick insisted I could I could fit in his, and try and sit in the passenger seat, and I'm like my knees hit the dashboard before they can go under the dashboard, yep. so it just it does it doesn't work. I mean, right now everything I drive is you know besides the truck is is German, 
because they, they tend to build for us taller folks. Our 2012 Passat's getting up there in miles and uh, we're looking for something that we can replace that with, but it's probably going to end up being something like another Passat because as much as I love it, they stopped making the Magnum and I want something newer. And Because the, the Magnum is a wonderful car for, for a larger person who wants something, uh, especially if you have any, anything to haul around with you. I found that to be true of a lot of the newer Chryslers, the Charger and the Challenger. Challenger especially is deceivingly large inside. Oh yeah, it's, I mean it's large on the outside too. <laughs> yeah, I mean I've been I've yeah, been on yeah, track. And, I mean I've been I've been in Challengers, Chargers, and a Magnum on track instructing, and I mean they're they're huge mm-hmm. cars, but I like having the extra storage that a wagon affords. That's and if you know Volkswagen actually would give us a decent wagon, I'd love to buy one, especially that RT on shooting brake. But you know we're we're not worthy. But I'm not a big crossover person, so it it sucks for me. And everyone's killing sedans and. All the econo boxes are too small now. So yeah, it's uh, probably going to end up being another Passat or maybe a slightly used Passat GT with the VR6. And one so thing I can say about the Corvette, and sorry, uh, sorry, Gordon. No worries. I, I fit in the Lotus because it, the hips are low. So like my, my 52 inch you know, chest and shoulders, I have some place to put them. I've, you know, I've got air around me. And when I sat in Andrew Banks' Corvette, like the it, it comes up and it kind of curves over. You, the the B pillar like goes right into my shoulder and I can't do anything with it. So I, I feel you on the Corvette. It, it'd be nice to have like a C6 or a C7, but it's not in the cards. You rode in Chivalry C6 with me at NCM and it was a tight fit even in that car, which is yeah. much larger inside than the seven. I was uncomfortable in the C6. I, actually, I've never been comfortable in the C6. They're really cramped, actually. C6 I can actually fit in. I could possibly drive one in partial anger. C7, forget about it. Never going to happen. And one of the guys in the Corvette Club just got his C8, and I tried it on. And I'm very glad I did because I don't have to think about that car anymore. Oh, Spectacular man. automobile. Gordo doesn't fit. But going back to, to Mike's comment on the, the wagon, I worked with a guy, coached him at uh, Pocono in an AMG wagon. Holy hell, that car was stupid fast. I mean, balanced. It, it's a lot like the CTSV wagon. Very neutral. The handling was spectacular. The power was spot on. That car was da nuts. It was amazing. Again, a hundred plus thousand dollar car, but god damn, if you want to wagon you can just take and go crazy with get you one of them <laughs> i don't have the the imagination for the you know hyper cars and stuff like that and and i if i could make something fit at any cost it would probably be on the corvette track it'd probably be the zr1 it'd be one of those mm-hmm. you know that's a garage queen in my mind dropping half that equation saying that size is important but the money's not an object i guess i've always loved the idea of some of the uh pro touring mod like or like mid sixties, a bodies, um, <laughs> Dodge darts, like smaller, smaller muscle cars, like economy cars from back in the day with a, with a blank slate and a, or I should say a blank check. <laughs> well, big engine, lots of turbos, lots of LS, but the more upright, like my first and only track day in my, my Chevy SS, which is a big sedan in itself. And I fit in it driving around so well. I love it. I just need an LSA like you, Gordon. But as soon as I, I put my helmet on, so I'm like doing a, a half a sit up through a 20 minutes track session. It was miserable. Every month or so I go out there and I stare under the seat looking for some, for an inch or something to cut out, but it isn't there. So I like the idea of more of an older body line with more of a vertical windshield with a higher head, right? Where I could have a nice, you know, upright seating position, whatever I wanted, but just like, especially as far as what I would build with unlimited funds, it would, it would have two seats in it and, and, and that's it. But, but having that blank slate, for all the power, all the suspension, all the safety, without any of the confines of a, you know, all those wonderfully aerodynamic shapes we enjoy today. Yeah, and, and honestly, with that said, most of us have taken whatever it is we have and we've engineered it to whatever specification we want. We've taken what we've got and made it better. And that's really, I mean, people have asked me repeatedly, why the F are you driving a Cadillac? It's like, because it fits and because I can and if you're willing to put the time in, there's no piece of sheet metal that you can't engineer to whatever it is you want it to do. And I'm finally getting to the point where the Cadillac is kind of, sort of, maybe, possibly, perhaps, 
what I've always imagined it could be. It's never going to be a uh, Ferrari Performante. It's not going to be a, you know, any of these other hypercars, but it, it's still not a bad ride for not a shit ton of money. And it's a unicorn and a unicorn's kind of fun to drive. <laughs> so true, true. why not? I thought you drove it because it fit in at the retirement home. Oh, <laughs> he can put his golf clubs in the back. That's right. And my, my walker <laughs> folds up behind the seat. <laughs> Clown on me if you want to, but I've always been a fan of the Nissan GTRs. I saw one at an auto show a while back, went to get in it. I got in it, but it was hard for me to get out of. And I was actually smaller. <laughs> I was smaller back then, you know, weight-wise. I was probably like 250 or so. Like my legs were cramping up trying to get out of it. So I've always wanted one of those, but that would be one of them. Another thing is a Buick GNX. I mean, I was born in the 80s. I fell in love with that G-body body style, the long nose, you know, coupe basically with a, a big engine in it. But the GNX, for whatever reason, stood out. I mean, it, it was the only turbo car from the 80s that I actually, like, fell in love with. Mm -hmm. um, aside, well, the Monte Carlo SS isn't exactly a GNX, but that's my second favorite. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then lastly, if money were no object, no limit whatsoever. I would have a Konus Egg Agaro RS. They are just absolutely gorgeous to me. And honestly, mm -hmm. I probably wouldn't even drive it. I'd say, hey, Eric, go <laughs> drive that for me because I can sit in it. <laughs> Show me what it can do. <laughs> I have achieved baller status. Don't need to go any further. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Someone can drive me to the track and I'll watch my car drive. <laughs> I, I am totally okay with this arrangement. Whenever you're ready, sign me up. <laughs> yeah, but those are those three cars are, you know, if I had unlimited money, it would be a built version of the first two, so the Nissan and, and the Buick. And then obviously, I like I said, I probably wouldn't even touch the Koenigsegg. It'd just sit there and I'd just admire it for what it is. Uh, and I guess I'll go ahead and throw my, my stuff out there. If money was no object and height was no object, I'd love a C7R. You know, they're decommissioned now, so you can probably pick one up for peanuts. And I say peanuts like, you know, what, $500,000 or something, whatever the factory shall be selling those for. Also, I've always been fascinated with the Shelby Daytona Coupes. I think those cars are beautiful cars. They're, they're, and I know Factory 5 makes a, a replica version of one. I can't even fit my, my right foot in it, let alone my entire body. You, know, you, you remember that trip, Brad? You remember that trip to uh, the kit car show like 12 years ago? We, we were getting yes, in trouble yes, for sitting all those cars like without, uh, without even asking. But yeah, we, we, you could get in, but you can't get out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And when I drove uh, Andrew Banks Lotus, I mean, the only reason I was able to get in is because the roof was off. And I literally just stepped and lowered myself into it like I was on an elevator. And then I would also like a 911, like a, a 911 Carrera 4S or something like that. Th those, I think, are just great cars. And Mike touched on something in one, one of the earlier podcasts that I hadn't even thought about, and I don't even know why. But an Audi R8 is a, a beautiful car as well. So I think those, those would be my choices. And so we're going to go around the horn one more time. Uh, and just to close us out, I want to hear your, your funniest or most embarrassing or, or most exciting big guy little car story. Just anything that has to do with you being a big guy climbing into out of a little car. Uh, Jason, Eric has told me that you've got plenty of stories. So let's go ahead and hear one of your gems. Yeah, I'll give you I'll give you one that's a little bit longer and one that's super fast. So I flew out to a big conference out in San Francisco and made the cardinal sin of laying over in Chicago and I ended up having like a six hour delay, seven hour delay. So I roll into SFO and go to pick up my rental car because I had to go back and forth between San Francisco and Santa Clara for some customer meetings. And I roll up to the Hertz counter and it's like one o'clock in the morning, West Coast time. So it's like 4 a.m. East Coast. And the guy's like, we've only got two cars left. And he was like, I can give you a discount and charge you $350 a day for the Escalade, or you can take the Fiat 500. And I'm like, <laughs> you got to be kidding me, dude. Call the manager. And they're like, <laughs> I, and they're like, this is what we got, right? You can either take the Fiat or you can pay $350 a day. And I didn't think my company was going to be real jazzed about me paying, you know, for the week for an Escalade. So I take the Fiat. Right. And literally like there's, and I'm not lying to you, there's barely enough room for me and my bag for the week to get into this vehicle. 
So like I'm riding it and my head's cocked all the way to the over like my right shoulder so I can like squeeze into it. And, you know, it's driving in San Francisco is bad enough. So I get to the hotel and the woman who works the front desk is like smoking a cigarette out front because it's like two o'clock in the morning. And she's like, oh, my God, I can't see through the car. She's like, you literally take up the entire car. Like, thanks. Thanks, lady. Appreciate it. Yeah, so I spent the entire week running up between San Francisco and Santa Clara in that thing. And I, I literally thought I was going to die. Um, everyone that saw me is like, Dude, that looks ridiculous. Like, that's, that's awful. <laughs> that's one of the good ones. Second one is I was out with a bunch of buddies. And one of my friends had a couple too many drinks out at a bar in uh, Baltimore. And he's got a Mercedes SLK. And, you know, I, I hadn't had enough to drink to where I couldn't drive. So I was like, I'll, I'll drive your car home. So we put the top down and it took us about three seconds to figure out there wasn't a chance to help that I was going to be able to drive that vehicle. Like I started to slide <laughs> down and like literally my shoulders were above the windshield. Like, I mean, it was like, <laughs> it wasn't like my head was above it. It was like my entire shoulders and everything. It looked like a go-kart and we're like, Who's calling the cab? Like, that's it. We're like, we're leaving the car here. <laughs> if it gets stolen, sorry. But yeah, I got to ditch it. So that's that's two of, two of my good ones. They are really good ones. I love the, the Fiat 500. I would drive one if I could fit my head under, the, under the, the roof line. I need to follow that because one of my stories involves a Fiat 500 as well. <laughs> <laughs> I never coached with Hooked on Driving Southern States before. And Shively and I are going down to a event at Roebling and Shively goes way back with Dave Auer. And I, I had briefly met him, but he didn't know me by name. So I show up and find out I've been assigned a uh, student who drives a Fiat 500. And for those unfamiliar with the driving, they like to have the coach drive the car for the first two laps. That wasn't happening. That just <laughs> wasn't happening. <laughs> the other thing I will say is fortunately Roebling road is mostly right-hand turns. Because at that point, I was ballast, <laughs> and I was sitting in the car with my helmet on, reclined with my head cocked to the side. And Auer did not see me get in the car. Auer saw me got, get out of the car. <laughs> and his jaw just kind of dropped. And he's like, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, obviously, there's my, my 135i convertible stories from Germany, and I've shared a link to one of the photos from my time in that. We were airborne on the Nürburgring with my head above the windshield, the convertible top down, going into a braking zone, into a corner. With and no helmet, by the way. With no helmet. No helmets required over there. I didn't pass a broomstick test without a helmet, so it <laughs> <laughs> doesn't matter. And if you look really closely in that picture, you actually will see that there's someone in the passenger seat curled up almost in the fetal position, scared for his life. And then way back, there was also a time I had to uh, instruct in a Honda Prelude. And, and that was one of those, I'm basically lying down in the passenger seat to instruct this car. And the problem is like a lot of cars, if you recline, you get more headroom. But in a Prelude, the roof starts to come down so quick that as I'm reclining, the roof is going down faster than my head. So I'm reclined and then have to scoot down and, and bunch up my legs at the front to even, and, and the, the chief instructor just ha of that event just happened to walk by and he looked in the car and just shook his head and walked away. All right. And Brian, do you have any, uh, any, any amusing stories for us? I have two short ones. So I was probably, uh, I want to say like 24 or so. And my buddy Jason comes to my house and he picks me up in his dad's Miata. <laughs> And um, <laughs> I look at him and Jason. What could Jason go wrong with that? Probably, yeah, he, he's like 5'9", five, 5'10". Five, and he looks at me and he looks at the car and he goes, bad choice. And I said, no, we can make it work. We can, we'll make it work. But the top goes down, right? And he goes, yeah. And I'm like, oh, well, let's try it with the top up first. So I managed to get in. Obviously, my head plastered the, the top of the Miata, the soft top. And we're riding down the road. And every bump I hit, I feel like I'm just in a rubber band. I'm just going up and down constantly in this state of bouncy ball, basically, in the seat. And I said, hey, man, pull over. Let's, let's put the top down. So we put the top down, and, like, I readjusted to get more comfortable. Obviously, I have more headroom now. We're riding down the road, and I remember my, my eyes were level with the top of the windshield. So I, I really couldn't see anything unless I'm, like, looking around. And I felt something hit my face. <laughs> And I was like, what the hell was that? And it was, it was a rock. It hit the top of my forehead. 
<laughs> so like I'm, I look at him and I'm like, hey, am I am I bleeding? And he's like, no, what, why? And I was like, I'm getting pelted with stones over here. Can we put the top back down? And he's like, yeah, yeah we'll put it down when we stop. Where it's just right up the road. I'm like, all right, whatever. So I like duck down behind the windshield. We get to where we're going. We have a good time. I think we were at a cookout at a friend's house we hadn't seen in a while. We uh, we're getting ready to go home, and the top gets stuck. We couldn't get it up. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know the Miata. It's his dad's car. I'm looking at him. He's looking at me. I'm like, whatever, let's go. Starts raining <laughs> on our way home. So we're driving home in the rain. My head's above the windshield. I feel like I'm getting stung by bees. Man, I get home. My hair was greasy and oily. <laughs> it was like, I don't know. I washed my hair like five or six times. There's still shit coming out of it. So that, that was the one big guy, small car in a Miata. And the other one is me and my buddy Jeff went to the auto show down in the Baltimore Convention Center. And this is about 2008. And we're walking around and I'm like, what in the hell is that? It looks like a baby Viper, just this tiny little baby Viper. Get up to it and it was a Dodge Demon concept at the time. And it was this two-door little coupe and little roadster looking car. It was almost like a Z3 at the time. And I'm like, I got to get in this thing. <laughs> so... I open the door and I get it in and I adjust everything and I'm looking at it and he's looking at me. I'm like, yeah, man. And I, I'm like looking around, looking at all the interior stuff. And I, I look over and he's gone. My buddy Jeff had wandered off. You know how we are kids in a candy shop and a car show. We're just kind of like, oh, what's that? Squirrel, what's that? Anyway, I look over, he's gone and I go to get out and I cannot get out of this car. <laughs> and at this point, my, you know, I'm, I'm starting to get, red in the face i'm getting embarrassed because i literally could not get out i'd go to sit up my knees were under the steering wheel i couldn't lift my legs to to like really swing them out because of the steering wheel i i really don't know how i got in the car to be honest with you yeah it was about five minutes later and one of the uh i guess one of the showgirls walked by with the little pamphlet things and i was like hey can you go get that guy over there with the backpack on and she's like that one and i'm like yeah so she goes over there and taps on the shoulder. He comes over and takes a picture of me stuck in this car. And then he proceeds to help me out. At this point, I'm like, I want to go home. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm done with this auto show. I was just embarrassed. But yeah, those are my the two bad stories that I've had for, for big guy and tiny cars. All right, we'll go over to Andrew because I have a feeling Gordon's got something really special for us. <laughs> so we'll oh. save him for last. <laughs> Oof, no pressure. I spent a, a summer working at CarMax. I had a fun test drive with Brad the first time I met him. That was three big guys in a Mustang, but that there was plenty of instances of having cars like an S2000. Uh, what else? There was some, something else. Like I remember having to actually, when we're taking the cars off the lot for a test drive, I'd have to go inside and get my manager or get another salesman to pull it off the lot and hand the keys over to, to my customer because I couldn't really drive the car. It's like, okay, that's a small one. But another rental car story. I was, I, my wife's daily driver got dinged up and it was going in the body shop and I had to rent a car and I called my, one of my friends who worked for enterprise and just said, Hey man, what are they going to give me for $30 a day? And, and he's walking me through. He's like, listen, they always have a quad cab pickup on the lot that they, they never rent it out. They, they would be happy to give it to you, but, but you can't just ask for it because it costs more money. Right? So I get picked up from the, the auto body dealer by this nice young lady from enterprise and she's five, five foot tall. And we're, she's driving some kind of Nissan. I don't even know what it is. Cause it was so small. I don't know if they put a name badge on it. But he told me, he said, listen, when she comes to pick you up, don't get comfortable in the car. Like kind of make it obvious that you're a big dude. And I put, I put the seat all the way back. My knees were still touching the dash. I had my work bag up in my lap and we're halfway there. And she looks over and she's like, you don't look very comfortable in this car. I'm like, nah, I guess I'm not, you know? And, and she's like, okay. It's like, do you want me to look and see if we have something bigger for you back at the office? I'm like, yeah, if you can, that'd be nice. And sure enough, I had like a month's rental on a, on a Dodge Ram quad cab, which was, which was great. But getting that little, that little hookup from my friend was helpful. So take, take, take advantage of your, of your big guy in a small car status every once in a while. So I related to that. I was at an, uh, in Tampa for work in like 2002. So first we had to return our Pontiac Sunfire because the, the car just blew up. I was driving a coworker back to the airport and the car just went haywire and was rpms range was going all over the place transmission wouldn't go into gear went to the airport not surprised i walk up to i walk up to the counter i'm on tui with three other people so and we were dropping one off so there's still gonna be three of us left to come back to the airport later so i'm returning the sunfire and she goes well we have a mitsubishi mirage and then looks up and goes (laughs) 
I have a Mitsubishi Lancer that I'm going to put you in. <laughs> <laughs> you know, sometimes, sometimes just the look you give, I'm just staring at her like, are you, are you kidding me? And, and she, she instantly got the clue. And uh, fortunately, I didn't have to try and put on my, uh, another left shoe. If you'll help me upload these at some point, there's a picture of me in the Cadillac pulling it off the trailer, and I forgot to release the tie-down straps. And just at the point where the Cadillac went off the back of the trailer, the straps went tight. Car wouldn't go back. Car wouldn't go forward. Gordon couldn't open the door. It's a 95-degree <laughs> day, and I lost my shit. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I think I'm a pretty composed guy. I was freaking the F out. I'm sweating. I'm like, oh, my God, oh, my God. Then I realized, just turn on the air conditioner, okay? Just get okay. So, But how am I going to get out of the car? So I climbed out the passenger window. Then my wife had the bright idea to film me getting back in the car because now I got to get it off the damn trailer. So I cut the straps, but I get it back in. So I'm doing the inchworm in through the driver's side window. I climb in and my big fat ass disappears in. My head goes down into the passenger footwell. I got to turn myself around. There's a great video of this. So y'all need to see that yeah, at some it, point. It's, it's the scene where Jim Carrey comes out of the back of the hippopotamus <laughs> in Ace Ventura. Beautiful. <laughs> it's, it's, it's played backwards. <laughs> <laughs> what I do have is me and Crutch riding in cars. So... <laughs> Me and Crutch riding in his bug, and we got lots of looks from people in the paddock, and me and Crutch riding in the Cadillac, which was decidedly different because one has about 12 times more horsepower than the other. Two guys in a small-ish car. The, the bug was just funny. But my story is, again, a rental story. The wife working for Corporate America we went up to the West Coast, and we're in San Francisco going to, to Monterey. And so I rented a Jaguar F-Type R from Hertz. Gold Club member got a banging deal, and and I actually kind of sort of fit in the car. So we're driving south on a Saturday, and we decided to stop at Pebble Beach and have lunch. I go to get out of the car, and I dislocate my right hip. It took three guys our size to get me out of the vehicle, Holy to shit. load me on a stretcher, to take me to the hospital, to relocate my hip. <laughs> so be careful what you ask for. <laughs> I mean dude, you can't believe the pain. I couldn't feel my feet. I, I mean, just like, oh my God. And it's just, I think it's probably a prior orthopedic injury from football. I don't know. But just suddenly it's, I went to get out. And something went pop. And it's like, oh, F me. This is not good. And so, yeah, the car went back to the dealer. And I think we drove a, we drove a, uh, a, a sob something or other the rest of the time. Not an F type R. So you played football back in 77 at NC State? <laughs> Shut up, asshole. <laughs> <laughs> I played football at some point in time. Not well. Um, that's why I work for a living now. Size doesn't buy you anything, apparently, other than yeah. bad joints. It just costs you more. <laughs> yeah. Oh, dude. It, it, so I mean, y'all don't I'm, – I'm 60, actually 61. I'm the oldest guy in the room. And shit does break, I'm just telling you. Your shit is going to go bad at some point, and it's not going to be fun. Just saying. That's why I drink heavily. Get over it. <laughs> but there is a vehicle I discovered that we may want to discuss that I think will will satisfy all of your big guy needs and give you performance and everything like that. I recently discovered this vehicle. It is a uh, it is a domestic. It was built from 2006 to uh, 2011. But think <laughs> it is a performance vehicle. You can get it with that turbocharged four cylinder, making close to 300 horsepower. I mean, that's an ultimate track weapon right there. You betcha. <laughs> It's known as the uh, Chevy HHR. Have you guys heard of that? Oh, yeah. Oh, gee. Ugliest pickup that ever existed. <laughs> oh, I, think I think Jason's camera says it all right there. <laughs> no, no, the, the, H the SSR was the pickup. Oh, that's right. The, the, HH the, the HHR was the one that looks like a, an old box van, panel van. Oh, it's a, a PT retro Cruiser. Panel. It's a ripoff of a PT Cruiser, which is a horrible oh, thing to be. Yes. There's only one HHR that's worth looking at photos of, and that's the one it's that one blew. On fire. No, it blew up because the guy inside it used too much Axe body spray before lighting a cigarette. And it actually <laughs> happened in Maryland. <laughs> oh only good God. HHR. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's a it's a difficult time to be a guy in cars because everybody's building more efficient. 
you know, I, I look at all these econo boxes that are out and most of that shit's not engineered for guys like us. Fortunately, there's still people building bigger cars, but being an enthusiast, it, it is going to, I think, more challenging going forward, finding things, unless you're going to go a couple years back and, and re-engineer stuff to your specification, we're not going to find stuff off the floor that's going to really meet our needs anymore. Well, mm-hmm. I mean, with, with the current trending in, in badge engineering, the Civic will now place its badge on the back of the Honda Pilot. Because it's getting bigger <laughs> every year. So currently it's on the Accord. It's okay. But nobody wants to track an SUV. No, wait, 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 wait. I, I, have, I have one more question I want to pose to you guys real quick. Uh, just uh, I, I think it's a, an interesting one. But if you could ask automakers today to make one concession for the large guy, what would it be? I would say legroom. Give me two inches, three inches extra in any vehicle. There's probably 90% more cars that I could consider owning. More vertical variation in seat height. Because like Volkswagen has the, has those pump up seats. And if it could just go down a little bit more, a lot of them would be a lot more comfortable for, for people with longer torsos. But, you know, they want to put 500 pounds of seat heaters and, and stereo equipment under the seat for some reason. So mine's kind of weird. I can't stand how they take a lot of the seats and like up around the shoulders, how they wrap them around and bring them more towards the steering wheel. Like I feel like in a lot of cars, I'm like constantly hunched over and the shoulder like, it's, bolstering, yeah. yeah, it's just, it's constantly uncomfortable. Like I want a car that drives like a bat out of hell, but doesn't have those like shoulders pushed forward. I think those are the kind of the dimensional challenges. I was going to add that as a big guy, we sweat. <laughs> I miss the old feature from my old Thunderbird. The air conditioning vent, I'm just going to say, it's right directly below the steering column, all right? <laughs> that used to be a thing on cars. A lot of Fords had it. The ball sweat cooler. The ball, the ball chiller was amazing. So I'm just going to say, like, I don't think it would take much, but every car I get in, it's a hot day. I'm like, I flash back to being 16 years old and being like, this, this is the greatest part of my car. Then you need to supercharge the seat cooler. <sighs> yeah. Yes, yes, because I, I will say some like the navigators and stuff have cooling seats. Or at least they, they did. I don't know if they still do. It's, I think some of the luxury cars have cooling seats where they're not just heated, but they also have like air conditioning pumping through the through the seats perforations. I mean, if anything, everybody's already got the things aside from the ball chiller. I didn't even think about that. But uh, yeah, uh, what you're saying with the navigator, the cool seats, the Jeep. I, Eric, I don't know if yours has cooled seats. Mine has cooled seats. But when I drive the, the Jetta, yeah, the, the ball chiller would be great. I understand the wraparound part with the shoulders because I have wide shoulders as well definitely more leg room for anybody if the seat could go back you know even like an inch and a half it, it'd just be better and then the height variation of course it's just a play on everybody if it were all together i think they guys would be two inches happier <laughs> size chrysler, does matter i believe chrysler calls that the pro chiller just want to let you guys know but but <laughs> jason brought up a really good point a car that goes bad out of hell has a room for a big guy and all that kind of thing there is actually one car i can think of that checks all those boxes the car i'm thinking of is actually the challenger hellcat 700 yeah. horsepower with tons nice. of space built for bigger guys and it looks good it sounds good it comes in a manual does all the right things i mean if this was an episode of what should I buy? I would be advocating for that car for you guys, 110%. Unless you drove, want to take it to the track. I drove one of those this afternoon. A patient of mine is a neurosurgeon, had one, brought it to the office today, and I had some time, so we took it and went around some of the roads near the office. And I've worked with a guy at, at Pocono with one. I am absolutely astounded by how good that car is. It is large. You know, it's 34 or 4,300 pounds. It's a big car. But they've really got that car dialed in. And what you, what you look at that car, if you open the hood on that, what you see is an engine, a clean installation. What you see in the Cadillac is what a bunch of crack-smoking Detroit engineers came up with on a Friday night. I mean, Chrysler has this stuff figured out. That car is spectacular. The Hellcat Red Eye, 797 horsepower. It's a Demon minus .01 for a shit ton less money. That is a banging automobile. And, and I like the Challenger. I like the original ones. I like the new ones. So I'll just add this. I've driven an original SRT8 on track at NCM. I thought it was fantastic. I wasn't really a fan of the truck interior that it had. But once, you know, that was a Mercedes thing. Everything looked like it was a pickup truck. But once Fiat got their hands on it, they've really made it a, a great place to live inside. I have gotten the opportunity to drive a brand new Hellcat. I will say it's an exercise in patience because it's big horsepower, but it was really rewarding. The Magneto suspension was fantastic. The car was really on point compared to a regular Challenger. They really got that car sorted out. I can't imagine 
what the demon is like with a thousand horsepower and all that. I mean, it was, it was a, it was a lot of work to keep the Hellcat under control. And again, it's an exercise in patience, but it was very rewarding at the end of the day. Yeah, the I, I would sell line everything car. I had. The Demon's not designed to go around corners. I mean, that's a straight line car. The Hellcat yeah. and the Red Eye are both cars that could be adapted to the track. And there are guys that are actually doing that. I mean, there's a bunch of guys that have modified those cars, you know, much like what guys have done with the, I mean, the ZL1 Camaro, I think, spectacular car. All of these cars with high horsepower, if you take a little bit of time and take what the factory gave you and massage it a little bit, you got a pretty damn capable track car. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I, I, I could go cheap too and go for a 392 with the scat pack. I mean, it's perfectly yeah. fine. And absolutely. <laughs> 500 will work. Yeah. When I had that Challenger, I had an Alpharetta, Georgia. It was just the, the six cylinder, you know, the base model Challenger. I was going to say, I fit really comfortably in that car. In and out was easy. The features on the inside, like you were saying, I'm just used to those features because of the Jeep, and it's easy for me to transition from the Jeep into the Challenger because it's basically the same layout on the dash. It's just a you know misplacement of a few things here and there, but from a familiarity standpoint, that thing you know that that would be a, a good car for me. <laughs> I liked it. Guys at the track, you know, we talk about their Miatas, and their yearly consumable budget is my weekend consumable budget. <laughs> <laughs> what the hell it's not it's not fair we need 50 dollars tires for the big cars <laughs> good luck we, with we need like an exoset challenger there to get go. rid of all the weight or just take like a mini cooper clubman and just rip the front seat out and drive from the back right like <laughs> basically <laughs> and then put an lsa in it pedal extender. yeah yeah you get long pedal extenders so i guess the answer for regular people is miata always and the answer for big guys is always Hellcat. I think that's what we've stumbled upon. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Now on that bombshell. <laughs> on that note, I think it's time to end. That was our special moment. We were to share that. <laughs> what, what happens in Cadzilla stays in Cadzilla. There you go, baby. And this is awesome. Thanks for having me on, everybody. This is oh, a blast. Of course. Very good. And if any yeah, Thank you all. Yeah, and if any of you guys want to be on in a future episode, don't hesitate to reach out. We got a list of different topics we're going to cover and and we'll definitely share that with you guys so don't hesitate especially to jump on some of the what should i buy episodes those are always a lot of fun and you can throw something out there and just let the piranhas chomp on it for a while so looking forward to that well thank you all for being on we really appreciate it and as eric said we we would love to have you back for uh, another episode uh and uh, yeah i guess that's it peace (laughs) peace If you like what you've heard and want to learn more about GTM, be sure to check us out on www.gtmotorsports.org. You can also find us on Instagram at Grand Touring Motorsports. Also, if you want to get involved or have suggestions for future shows, you can call or text us at 202-630-1770 or send us an email at crewchief at gtmotorsports.org. We'd love to hear from you. Hey listeners, Crew Chief Eric here. Do you like what you've seen, heard, and read from GTM? Great, so do we, and we have a lot of fun doing it. But please remember, we're fueled by volunteers and remain a no annual fee organization, but we still need help to keep the momentum going so that we can continue to record, write, edit, and broadcast all of your favorite content. So be sure to visit www.patreon.com forward slash GT Motorsports or visit our website and click in the top right corner on the support and donate to learn how you can help.